بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد uh, Last Wednesday we were talking about uh, the preparation of the hijrah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and we had mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ had passed by a group from Yathrib, and he asked, who are you? Small group, he didn't recognize them. And they said, we are from the Khazraj. And he didn't recognize which Khazraj, because it's not one of the big tribes. He sat with them, he gave them da'wah, and they converted, and some of them thought of converting, but the point was there was an openness, and they said, let us think about this affair, and we'll come back the following year. So, this is not a formal conversion of all six, it's rather, the six people are interested in this new religion. Is it something interesting? Is it something we should be thinking about or not? And perhaps they converted on the spot, perhaps they converted at when they went back to uh, the city of Medina. Of course, remember, at this time, Medina is not Medina. Medina is Yathrib. Medina is Yathrib. It will be called Medina, after the emigration of the Prophet ﷺ, he will change it to the name Medina. But now it is called Yathrib. So they go back and for the next year, they simply spread the message that there is this new religion, there's this new Prophet preaching the message of monotheism, of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And the next year, they sent a message to the Prophet ﷺ that we're coming for Hajj, we're coming for the pilgrimage with 12 people who have converted. These are now converts to the faith. And this is the largest group of converts from outside of Mecca since the beginning of the da'wah. Never have 12 people, it sounds so small, but never have 12 people converted from any group outside of Mecca and outside of the Quraysh. And therefore, in the 11th year of the da'wah, remember we're talking still before the hijrah, so this is two before hijrah. In the 11th year of the prophetic preaching, 12 people came from the city of Yathrib, 10 from the Khazraj and 2 from the Aus. 10 from the tribe of the Khazraj and 2 from the tribe of the Aus. And they met with the Prophet ﷺ in the plains of Aqaba. There was no need to be secret because there's only 12. And these are just the regular pilgrims coming from, from Yathrib. Unlike the year afterwards, it's going to change. But now... There, it's nothing to be, it was 12 people having a conversation with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Also we noticed that for the first time, the Aus and the Khazraj seem to be forgetting about their hostility and coming together under the common platform of Islam. The Aus and the Khazraj were enemies of one another. The Aus and the Khazraj had a civil war between themselves for five years in which they had decimated each other's populations. Now this new religion comes, and this new religion causes them to forget about the past. It's a positive beginning. Never before have the Aus and the Khazraj come together for anything. Now for the first time, we see what's going to happen with this new religion of Islam. It will cement bonds. It will overcome that which disunited the people, it will unite them together. Nonetheless, it's still the beginning. So, ten are from the Khazraj, two are from the Aus. So there's still some familial ties, there's still some tribalism, because the first converts were from, where were the six converts from? The Khazraj. And therefore, the next year, the bulk are still from the Khazraj. It's going to take a while to overcome this split. It's going to take a while. But nonetheless, slowly but surely, we see Islam will unite these pagan tribes. Islam will come and cause them to forget about their uh, problems in the past. In this uh, meeting of 12 people of Medina, of Yathrib, with the Prophet ﷺ, this was the first time a formal conversion took place. And in those days when anybody converted, we already said that they would uh, give an oath to the Prophet ﷺ. They would literally place their hand in his hand and they would swear a conversion. That they are converting to the new faith. And Ubadah ibn Samit was one of those who witnessed, the famous Ubadah ibn Samit. All of you know the name is very familiar to anybody who reads the seerah. Ubadah ibn Samit is one of those who attended this first uh, covenant. And it is called obviously the first covenant of Aqaba. Bay'atul Aqaba til Ula. The first covenant of Aqaba. Don't get confused. A lot of people get confused here. What happened the year before is not called a covenant. The six people who spoke with the Prophet says this is not called a bay'ah. 
because there was no formal bay'ah. It was just a conversation, and we don't even know did they accept Islam on the spot, or did they go back and accept? It was simply the opening up of their hearts to Islam. So, Ubadah ibn Samit said, he's narrating this himself, and this is in Bukhari, I was of those who took the first bay'at al-ula uh, al-aqaba, the first covenant of aqaba. It's called aqaba because one of the areas of Mina is aqaba. This is where the jamarat are. This is where the three Jamarat are. And the people of Yathrib, their camping spot was close to the large Jamra. We already said that in those days, uh, even in our days actually, the entire Mina is divided according to geographies, according to ethnicities, right? Even to this day when you go for Hajj, American pilgrims, one area, all of us. We have one area on Mina. So in those days, every tribe had it. So the, the tribes of Medina had a small area in Aqaba. And this, this oath took place on the plains of, of, of Mina. On the plains of Mina, in their campgrounds, there's no need for any privacy because the Prophet is going publicly preaching his message. Nobody needs to care that another few people have converted, even though it was the largest conversion outside of Mecca. So Ubadah ibn Samit said, I was of those who participated. And it was the oath of the women, he called it. Bay'atun Nisa. What is Bay'atun Nisa? The oath of the women was an oath that had no political connotations. It's just an oath of morality and theology. Because later on, the next oath will be an oath of support, an oath of alliances, an oath of political support. And that's a different type of oath. The second bay'ah, it's not going to be called the oath of women. When women would convert, the Prophet would only ask them to live moral and righteous lives and to be good Muslim uh, worshippers of Allah. So, this is called the oath of women because there are no political connotations. There's nothing to do with protecting the Prophet ﷺ, nothing to do with if somebody attacks you have to defend. No, nothing like this. So, Ubadah said, the first covenant we did, it was like Bay'atun Nisa. And we swore our allegiance to worship Allah alone. That's the main point of Islam. We're going to give up our, our idols. We're going to worship Allah alone. And we're not going to fornicate. We're not going to steal. We're not going to uh, kill our children as they did in the the days of Jahiliyyah. We will not live immoral and unrighteous lives and we will obey the Prophet in all good matters. So we will be basically good Muslims. And remember at this time the five prayers have not firmly been established. Uh, At this time zakah has not quite been established. At this time there is no Ramadan. At this time there is no Hajj. So what do you have to do to be a Muslim? Basically, worship Allah and live righteous lives. Give up, not even alcohol, because alcohol was banned in the third year of the Hijrah. Right? Still alcohol has not yet been banned. So what did these early Muslims have to do? Give up fornication and murder and stealing and worship Allah alone. So we all gave him our oath of allegiance. We all gave him our oath of allegiance. One of the, uh, 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 one of the things of this oath, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever fulfills this, whoever lives a righteous life, his reward will be with Allah. Allah will give you paradise. And whoever falls short and repents, then Allah will forgive you. And if you don't repent, then you might be punished. So basically it's pure theology. It's pure simple Islam. You live good lives, you'll get to paradise. You live bad lives, try to make it up and Allah will forgive you. It's a very simple oath. There's no political connotations at all. When these 12 converted to Islam, they requested some help in terms of teaching Islam, in terms of somebody to tell them, teach them the Qur'an. Um, I said salah had not been legislated, of course it had been, my mistake. The, the Isra has occurred by this time. The Isra wal Mi'raj has occurred, the salah has been legislated. And so the Prophet ﷺ chose out of all of the converts, there were at least 250 converts now, at this stage, at least 250 male converts, at least. The Prophet ﷺ chose Mus'ab ibn Umair, to send back with them to go to Yathrib. He chose Mus'ab ibn Umair to teach them the Qur'an and to lead them in Salah. And it is narrated that within a few weeks of Mus'ab reaching Yathrib, 40 people had converted to Islam. Within a few weeks. And therefore, the Prophet told them they may establish Jum'ah Salah. 
And so the very first Friday prayer ever in the history of Islam was actually not done by the Prophet ﷺ. It was done at his command. But in Mecca they couldn't pray in public, as you know. In Mecca they could not pray in public. In Mecca they would have been persecuted and killed. So the very first Friday sermon was delivered by Mus'ab ibn Umair in the house of As'ad ibn Zurara, who was the Ansari who hosed... Uh, uh, who hosted Mus'ab. So he was the one who Mus'ab allowed to live in his house. He had a large house with a large garden, a date palm grove. And, the, and this was where the first Jum'ah took place with 40 people. Now, uh, just a little bit of a tangent of fiqh here. What is the minimum required people necessary for Friday prayer? What is the minimum required people necessary for Friday prayer? The fuqaha or the scholars of fiqh have differed over this issue. One madhab said the minimum is 40. And they base it on this narration of Mus'ab and As'ad ibn Zurara. That the first Jum'ah took place with 40 people. And they say, this is their reasoning, the reason why Jum'ah became obligatory upon them was because they reached the number 40. But if you really think about it, was it because they reached the number 40 or it just so happened coincidentally that they were 40 when the Prophet ﷺ sent the letter to do Jum'ah? You see, which of the two ways do you look at it, right? And if you really look at it, the Prophet ﷺ didn't know how many people had converted. He didn't ask them for a survey, send me how many people. When the number 40 came, he then told them, oh, we have to now do Jum'ah. No, rather he gave them the command to do Jum'ah. And uh, it just so happened there were 40. This is the Hanbali Madhab, by the way, that you have to have 40 people. Therefore, according to the Hanbali Madhab, if you have 39 men, you should not pray Jum'ah. Right? This is one opinion of the Hanbali Madhab. This is, obviously doesn't seem to have very strong academic merit. Other Madhabs say you need to have a large group of people without unspecified number. But the fact of the matter is that there doesn't seem to be any number specified in the Sharia, and therefore it goes back to what is the minimal congregation that you need to have. Most scholars say the minimal congregation consists of three people, one of whom is the Imam. So if you have two people, according to this opinion, then you, may, you should do Jum'ah. If, uh, uh, if you have two people and an Imam, then you should do Jum'ah. And according to another opinion, actually if there are two people including the Imam, you should still do Jum'ah. So you have one person give the khutbah, and you have, mashallah, one person in attendance, right? And then you should also give uh, Jum'ah. So there is an ikhtilaf amongst the scholars. And Allahu A'lam, yani this is something that if there are ever two people muqeem in a place, and they decide to give uh, Jum'ah, inshallah there is no haraj on them. And if they say, you know what, there's only two, so we'll wait till we have one more, mashallah, to have a Jum'ah of three, then uh, that too is good. Somebody will say, has there ever been a Jum'ah of only two people? That you have one person and one, one imam and one person following? I say to this, I have participated in such a Jumu'ah. I have participated in such a Jumu'ah. Not that when the people heard I was coming, the masjid was empty, don't worry, that wasn't the case. Rather, when I was uh, a young teenager, this is a personal story, so just going back a little bit. When I was 19 years old, I used to work in Freeport, Texas, uh, at Dow Chemical. And there was no masjid, and there was no musalla even. There wasn't even a mosque or a musalla at the, the, the factory over there. And this is in the early 90s. Uh, uh, I'm sure they have a masjid now. So I sent out an email to all the Muslim names that I could find. Probably not the wisest thing to do these days, but back then it was excusable. Plus my age also excused this. And, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, one person responded. <laughs> that, khalas, let's have Jum'ah. So we showed up at his house, expecting a lot of people to come. Alhamdulillah, afterwards, you know, five, ten people came. But for the first time, it was just me and this one brother in the living room of his house. Because there is no musalla, no masjid. So the only khutbah in my life that I delivered uh, was I was giving the khutbah. And there was one man in front of me. And we gave, I gave a very short khutbah. It was a very strange khutbah. And then uh, I led the salah. And I'll never forget that. And this was the first Jumu'ah in, in Freeport. I'm sure now they have a masjid. Even when I was there over the next few months, more and more people heard. This is how you start, right? This is how you start. So if anybody says, has this ever happened? You, I actually have witnessed this uh, myself. And uh, it is possible. Nonetheless, yani, a fiqhi point here. 
Aqal uh, al-Jum'a, is it two or three? Scholars have differed, and some even say 40 because of As'ad ibn Zurara. Getting back to the story. Okay, getting back to the story. The Prophet ﷺ sent Mus'ab ibn Umayr, as we said, to Yathrib, to Medina. And eventually, it is said that every single sub-tribe of the Aws and Khazraj had a household at least of Muslims. Remember that their Jahili society is divided into sub-tribes, and every sub-tribe lives in its own subdivision. Because in those days, where you lived was where your tribe was. So eventually, there's not a single locality of Medina, except that there's one or more households that have embraced Islam. And the conversion of two people in particular led to a mass conversion, instantaneous conversion amongst the people of Yathrib. And these two were the up-and-coming leaders of the Khazraj. The up-and-coming leaders in the vacuum created by the wars of Bu'ath. These were As'ad ibn Zurara and Usaid ibn Hudayr. As'ad ibn, uh, uh, As'ad ibn Zurara, uh, sorry, Asan Zura is the one who, who's, housing, uh, who's housing Mus'ab. It is uh, Usaid ibn Hudayr and Sa'ad ibn Mu'ath, my mistake. Usaid ibn Hudayr, who, who knows his story? What is the famous about Usaid ibn Hudayr? There's a story in Bukhari about him. Anybody remembers this story? Usaid ibn Hudayr is the one who, whenever he recited the Quran, he would see the angels come down to listen to him. This is Usaid ibn Hudayr. That he would see some light coming down and, and listening to him. And he went to the Prophet he would recite it after Fajr. He went to the Prophet saying, every time I, recite, I see these, these lights and uh, my animals start getting agitated and I get worried what's going on, the Prophet said, these are Sakinat al-Rahman, these are the peace and the, and the, 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 the angels of, of al-Rahman coming to listen to your Quran. So basically continue reciting. And then Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was the second convert who opened up the door for all of the uh, other converts. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, who is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad? Who can tell me? The famous hadith about Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. When he died, Arsh al-Rahman, shook. This is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Hazza, it shook out of anger that somebody had killed him. This is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, right? So Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and Usaid ibn Hudayr were close friends. And Mus'ab was preaching in the house of As'ad ibn Zurara. Okay? You see these names already are very different from the Qurashi names. This is Madani names, they're Yathrib names. Much more Ains and much more uh, Hamzas if you like. So, uh, Usaid ibn Hudayr, Usaid ibn Hudayr was sent by Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Sa'ad and Usaid are talking. And Sa'ad says to Usaid, this new religion has come to our city, and my cousin, As'ad, so As'ad is his cousin. My cousin As'ad is housing the man who's spreading the faith. Who is? Who's the man? Mus'ab. Mus'ab. Mus'ab is being housed in Medina, right? My cousin is housing this man. Because he's my cousin, I feel awkward going. Why don't you go and expel this man from our city? Go and get rid of Mus'ab. Because who is he to come and preach against the religion of our forefathers? And so, he went with his spear. This is a sign of war. He went with his spear. He went to the house of As'ad. And when As'ad saw him marching with his spear, he said to Mus'ab, O oh Mus'ab, this is one of our leaders. This is one of the leaders of the Khazraj. He's getting scared now that he's coming with his, his javelin, with his spear to come and attack you. One of the leaders of the Khazraj. Yani make dua, have ikhlas. And we're gonna, something's going to happen here. right? So when he came, he began speaking in an angry voice and he said, Why have you come to our land? Have you come to brainwash those of, ours, my, those of us who don't have strong intellect? To take our women and children away from our ways and to convert them to the ways of this new prophet of yours? Go back to where you came from if you value your life. It's a threat. If you stay here, I'm going to kill you. Go back to where you came from if you value your life. Mus'ab responded with a calmness and confidence that only Iman can bring you. And Mus'ab said to him, Why don't you sit and listen to what I have to say? If you find it agreeable, then good. And if not, then I'll stop. At least listen. I mean, you haven't even heard what I have to say. So he found this to be a very reasonable request. And he sat down and he listened to Mus'ab 
preach to him the basic message of Islam. It was only after listening to some basic teachings of Islam that Usaid, his heart opened up to Islam. And he said, what you have said makes complete sense to me. How does one embrace your faith? Coming with a javelin to kill him, five minutes later he's saying, makes sense to me, well, let's, what, what, how do I convert? What do I have to do? And so Mus'ab said, go to ghusl and say the shahada and pray to rak'at. That's all you have to do. So he washed himself and said the shahada, pray to rak'at. And uh, he said, I have a person who has sent me, and this is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, I have a person who has sent me, if you can convince him of this, then you will have no opposition left. If you can convince him what you have just convinced me, you will have no opposition left. Musa said, go send him to me. Go send him to me. So, Usaid went back to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. And as Sa'ad saw him, he's sitting with his friends. Sa'ad said, this is not the same man who has left us. Because wallahi, when you leave paganism and you embrace la ilaha illallah, you, you change. When you embrace tawheed, you change. And Sa'ad said, this is not the same man that has left. Something is different about him. This is not the same man that has left us. And he went back to Sa'ad and he said, and uh, Sa'ad asked him, did you succeed? Usaid said, I tried talking to them, but why don't you try? Why don't you go and talk to them? So he's trying to get him to go, right? And to add some salt, some, some urgency, he said, and it has reached me that the tribe of such and such, he mentioned another tribe of Medina, the tribe of such and such has decided to kill Asad because he's housing Mus'ab, and also because he's your cousin and you're not doing anything. In other words, he's riling up his jahili tribalism. And he's saying, unless you do something, the other tribe will go kill him. Now, where did he get this from? Obviously, we will assume that there was an element of truth, that there were rumors that this tribe is going to kill Asad, he's, because Asad is the one housing uh, Musab ibn Umayr. And so he's basically telling these rumors, just like the father of Yusuf says, I'm worried the wolf is going to eat Yusuf. It's not a blatant lie, it's kind of sort of, it's kind of sort of stretching the truth. It's a, a white lie basically, right? So he's making a sense of urgency, you better go right now. That make sure they don't kill him. If anybody kills him, it should be you. That's the point, right? Make sure they don't kill him or else it's going to become a, a tribal warfare. So, uh, Sa'ad became alarmed at this and Sa'ad took his weapons. Sa'ad took his weapons and he went marching to the house of As'ad ibn Zurara and he said to As'ad, O oh As'ad, he's speaking to As'ad, not even Mus'ab now. O oh As'ad, this is his cousin. Had you not been my cousin, these weapons would not be hanging at my side. I.e., they would be unsheathed and out at you. Had you not been my cousin, these weapons wouldn't be hanging at my sides. And it's just because of our blood relationship that I am not taking this more. But get rid of this guest of yours, get rid of this person and tell him to leave our land and stop spreading his pollution amongst us. Mus'ab took over immediately without even us having And Mus'ab said, same thing. At least listen to what I have to say. You haven't even listened to what I'm preaching. Sit down and listen to what I have to say. And if you find it agreeable, then good. And if not, then I will stop. I mean, that's a very big condition. And Mus'ab gave it. Khalas. If you don't agree, then I, I'm, I'm, don't worry, I'll leave. Okay. And that's a very big, shows his confidence. I mean, it's a bit overconfident. But this is only the confidence of a Sahabi and his Iman. One of us would not make this, this condition, but Mus'ab made it. Because if, if you don't agree, then I'll stop. And so the calmness and the confidence of Mus'ab made Sa'ad think, okay, well, that's a valid point. It was the calmness and the confidence that he's not wavering, he's not frightened. Here's a man who doesn't even care about killing Mus'ab, much his own cousin, he's going to kill his own cousin, right? And yet Mus'ab is just staring him straight down and speaking with that gentleness and that politeness that only Iman can bring. And he says, listen to what I have to say. And once again he sat him down and this time he recited Surah Zukhruf. Hamim al kitab al Surah Zukhruf he recited. Beautiful recitation we can imagine now. And this completely changed Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Having heard the Qur'an, because again the Qur'an is the miracle. It is the miracle, right? And having heard it directly from Mus'ab's mouth, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh immediately said, how do I convert? 
Once again, exact same question. How do I convert? Where do I sign? What do I do to get to, to convert to this faith? And so Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh as well converted to the faith. And with the conversion of Sa'ad and Usaid, the entire tribe of the Banu al-Ashhal it is called, which is one of the sub-tribes of the Khazraj, the entire, the entire tribe converted along with them because these two were their leaders. And with their conversion, the tribe automatically had no problems converting. Within the span of a few weeks, the entire tribe of the Banu al-Ashhal converted and that was the largest conversion ever, mass conversion up until that point in time. With the conversion of these two. And... Uh, by the way, there's one exception. There's an interesting story. One person from the tribe did not convert. And his story uh, is a, a tangent as well, but it's very brief. His name was Usaidim. And Usaidim was the only pagan of the tribe of Banu al-Ashhal for the next four years. Two and, uh, three years. He remained a pagan. And he refused to convert. Slowly but surely, everybody converted. Usaidim remained on his paganism. Uh, and then he converted on one particular day. Abu Huraira used to quiz his students. Abu Huraira would say, Who can tell me the name of the man who entered Jannah when he, uh, while he never prayed one rak'ah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is obviously Usaidin. Who can tell me the name of the man who entered Jannah without having prayed a single rak'ah? And of course, the, the Dabi'un would not know. And uh, Abu Huraira would say, he is the Usaidim of the Banu Abd al-Ashhal. This is the sub-tribe of uh, Usaid and Sa'ad. He is Usaidim of the Banu Abd al-Ashhal. He remained firm on his paganism until the day of Uhud. Until the day of Uhud. And on the day of Uhud, on the morning of the battle of Uhud, he decided to convert. And when he came to fight in the battle, his people said, O oh, Usaidim, we have no need of you. You can't fight. You're not a Muslim. We, don't, we can't have your help here. We have no need of you. Usaidim said, I am here to fight. They said, are you going to fight out of tribal loyalty or out of love for Allah and His Messenger? Why are you defending us? Because again, they're being attacked by the pagans of Mecca. Are you defending us out of your tribal loyalty? In which case, we don't want you. Amazing. They are outnumbered three to one. Right? The Quraysh are 3,000, the Muslims are 1,000. They're being attacked. But they realize victory comes from sincerity and not from paganism. Victory comes from belief in Allah and not from belief in the idols. So they quiz him, are you helping and are you coming to us now? Because you're a member of our tribe and you feel threatened? Or are you coming to us because you love Allah and His Messenger? So he said, no. I, I am now a Muslim, I have converted, and I want to fight for the sake of Islam. And they took him to the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet wasallam quizzed him, he embraced the Islam, he converted, he took the shahada, and he embraced Islam after Salat al-Fajr, he became a shaheed before Salat al-Dhuhr. And so, no salah ever came at his time. He never had to pray because there was no salah to pray. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, He did very little, but he was rewarded a lot. And he is of the people of Jannah. Because he, obviously, if the time for salah had come, he would have prayed, but it's not his fault. He converted at, let's say, 9 a.m., he became a shaheed at, let's say, 11 a.m., right? So, well, how is he going to pray? What's he going to do? So because there was no time to pray, he is the only Sahabi that we know of who converted to Islam and mashallah died without having, ever having prayed a single salah. Nonetheless, getting back to our story, so uh, Mus'ab, uh, Mus'ab ibn Umair with his da'wah manages to convert a good population and a good amount of the people of Yathrib. And therefore, in the second year of Mus'ab's coming, which is the twelfth year of the da'wah, rather than twelve people coming, we now have around seventy-five Muslims who came to give the bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ. And by the way, these are seventy-five who went and did the hajj. One can imagine for everyone who went, there must have been at least two or three who cannot go that year. Right? Because again, not everybody goes for hajj every year. And so, 
around 75 people are actually coming from Medina to Mecca in order to perform the pilgrimage. And these are the ones who undertook the second bay'ah, bay'atul aqabat al-thaniya. And for every one of these, there must be at least two or three who are Muslims in Medina. And so in the second year, uh, sorry, in the in the twelfth year of the da'wah, the twelfth year of the da'wah, which is one year before the hijrah. Or to be more precise, it is only a few months before the hijrah. Because remember, the hijrah took place in the beginning of the thirteenth year of the, of the da'wah, right? And therefore, the hajj is taking place at the end of the twelfth year. And therefore, within a few months of the second bay'ah, the hijrah occurs. Remember, there's no zero year. There's no zero year. You have... One year before the hijrah, then the first year is the year of the hijrah. Time doesn't go zero. So one, B, one BH and then you have one AH. There is no zero AH, right? So the year of the hijrah is year one. The year of the hijrah is year one. And a few months before the hijrah is when this bay'atul aqaba takes place. Which is in Dhul Hijjah, the month of Dhul Hijjah. And the hijrah took place... Uh, as we will, uh, uh, as we will mention, two months after this. So, in the twelfth year of the prophethood, Mus'ab ibn Umair returned with around seventy-five converts. He's been gone for one year, and in one year, he manages to convert a minimum, a minimum of two hundred fifty to three hundred people. This is the largest group of converts outside of Mecca. And they are now rivaling in quantity the Muslims of Mecca. SubhanAllah, why did the people of Yathrib embrace Islam so quickly when the people of Mecca were so stubborn that in 13 years the quantity of converts is just a little bit more than what it is in Mecca? In, in Medina, excuse me. Why? Who can tell me? No persecution. No, well, number one, no persecution. Monotheistic existence in Number two, the, the monotheism tendencies of Medina, the people of Medina. But there's a biggest reason. <laughs> they had a fight which did what? <laughs> the tribal leadership had been decimated in their civil war. And so they had a younger generation, a fresh generation, who hadn't been raised up in the ways of paganism and who have tasted the ludicrousness of paganism. They have seen with their own eyes the foolishness of paganism. They've seen it because they've killed half of their, their leadership, or uh, half of their city has gone, all of their leadership has been killed. What, of what good has that done? Now there's a new message that teaching us to be moral, to give up bloodshed, to live good lives, to worship one God. So they were young, they had seen with their eyes the foolishness of their old ways, and they're wanting a change. And this is of the reasons that the people of Yathrib began to embrace Islam and mass. And so, around 75 people come for Hajj that year, and the Prophet ﷺ communicates with them and says, we shall meet up on the last night of the Hajj before everybody returns home. On the last night of the Hajj before everybody returns, meet me before the Fajr prayer by a few hours. Basically, in the last third of the night. Meet me in the valley next to Aqaba. It's a valley that is behind where the Ansar, where the, uh, they're not Ansar yet. Remember, I'm jumping the gun here. They're not Ansar and they're not Medanese yet. They're still Yathrib. And they're still people from Yathrib. Ansar, they would become after the Muhajirun come. So, uh, we're, we're being a little bit quick here, hasty, but inshallah it's excusable. The people who were to become the Ansar. Uh, because eventually they're going to be called the Ansar. So, the Prophet ﷺ says, meet me the very last night of Hajj, in the last third of the night in the valley of uh, the Aqaba that is behind where you camp. Jabir ibn Abdullah, the famous Jabir ibn Abdullah, who's probably one of the most famous of all of the Ansar. Jabir ibn Abdullah was an eyewitness to this conversion. And Jabir ibn Abdullah narrates that the Prophet ﷺ stayed for more than 10 years in Mecca, preaching to the people, uh, in Hajj, in the Hajj season. And he would ask them, this is Jabir summarizing the, 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 the Makki Sirah in one line basically. Jabir is a Madani, he doesn't know the Makki Sirah first hand. So he's summarizing it in one line. So the Prophet stayed in Mecca for more than 10 years. 
trying to find support from the other tribes when the Quraysh rejected him. And he would ask the other tribes, who will support me so that I can spread the message of my Lord? And he would not find anyone embracing his faith except for a man or two from Mudar or from Yemen or from this tribe. In other words, the converts were not en masse. The converts were one or two. How is, how is that going to help? You need some political base, right? Remember we said there had been converts, but not en masse. Until finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided us to Islam. A group from the people of Yathrib guided us to Islam. And we believed in him and we recited the Qur'an. We believed in him and we began to recite the Qur'an until not a single sub-tribe, Rahd, which is a sub-tribe, out of all of the people of Yathrib were there, except that some amongst them had embraced Islam. And therefore he's talking about the fact Islam spread in that one year. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused us to come together, and we spoke to one another and we said, for this is a beautiful line here. Ila mata nadaru Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yutradu fi jibali makkata wa yukhaf. For how long will we allow the Prophet sallallahu to be repelled from one valley to another outside of Makkah and to fear for his life? For how long are we going to let him do this? In other words, the idea comes now that we have two, three hundred converts here, why don't we tell him to come to our land? And Jabir says, Allah gave us this idea. He didn't even say, we thought of it. Because he's being modest. Because Allah gave them the idea. right? So Jabir says, until Allah gave us this idea, that we said to one another, إِلَى mata, For how long are we going to let the Prophet wasallam be rejected and be fearful of his life? For how long are we going to do this? And so, we gathered together, Jabir is saying, we gathered together in the last night of the Hajj. Another person who witnessed, I'm going to come back to Jabir's report, another person who witnessed this is Ka'b ibn Malik. Who is Ka'b ibn Malik? Who can remind me? You should now know these names now. Who is Ka'b ibn Malik? The one who? Tabuk. He's one, of, he's one of the three and the most famous of them and the one who narrates the story. And the one whom Allah revealed in the Quran, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةَ لَذِينَ خُلِّفُوا right? Ka'b ibn Malik is the one who refused or initially he didn't go to Tabuk. And then Allah revealed his repentance. Allah revealed, this is Ka'b ibn Malik. So Ka'b ibn Malik is witnessing here. And by the way, it goes without saying that every single one of these people becomes a famous Sahabi, obviously. When they sacrificed when Islam was small, Allah rewarded them when Islam was big. They sacrificed when Islam was difficult, Allah rewarded them when Islam became easier. So Ka'b ibn Malik also witnessed this treaty. And he said, that when we went for Hajj, we hid our Islam from our pagan relatives. Many of these Muslims were secret Muslims from their pagan relatives. This is the, the Khazraj. And we all agreed to meet at a particular place in the last third of the night. This is the valley behind Aqaba. And so, in the middle of the night, we began sneaking out of our tents one by one, so as not to arouse suspicion. Amongst the people uh, of Yathrib, amongst the Khazraj, so as not to arouse suspicion, we began sneaking out to meet with the Prophet ﷺ, and we waited for him, and eventually he came with his uncle Al-Abbas, even though Al-Abbas was still upon the religion of his people. Interesting. Abbas is coming, even though Abbas is still a pagan. He's still an idol worshipper at this time. And then we go back to the version of Jabir, and Jabir says, that when uh, his uncle Abbas came, Abbas said to the Prophet ﷺ, looking at all of these people, remember Abbas is a trader, Abbas knows the elders of Yathrib from his traveler days, but these elders have now died. The elders that Abbas would trade with are no longer there. So Abbas looks at all of these people and he says, Oh my nephew, I don't know any of these men. And I don't feel comfortable. Because Abbas is thinking in terms of jahiliyyah. Abbas is thinking in terms of tribalism. Who are these youngsters? They're none of the senior people that I recognized from, yet from Yathrib. And I, know, I knew many of them, but I don't recognize a single one amongst them. And this shows why Abbas is coming. Abbas feels 
a sense of loyalty out of tribalism, out of his nationalism. Abbas feels, look, the Prophet is leaving Mecca, he's leaving the Banu Hashim, I need to negotiate. It's a transfer of visas, right? I need to negotiate. If his uncle Abu Lahab has rejected him, I haven't rejected him. And as the senior most member of the Quraysh who still acknowledges him, I need to negotiate his release, if you like, to the people of Yathrib. And it shows us that, subhanAllah, the, the, Al-Abbas, uh, like Abu Talib, loved him with a natural love. And eventually he's going to convert to Islam. Remember, Abbas is one of the later converts. In the battle of Badr, in the battle of Uhud, Abbas is still in Mecca. Abbas has not come to Medina radiallahu anhu for a long time. Right? Unlike Hamza, Hamza comes immediately, and Hamza becomes Sayyid al-Shuhada in Uhud. You all know the story of Hamza, we're going to get to that. Abbas took a while, but he has genuine love for the Prophet and also Abbas and the Prophet were of a similar age. And so, uh, and they were also foster brothers as well. They were foster brothers, uh, and being uncle and nephew. And so there was a strong bond of friendship even though it was uncle and nephew, but there's a strong bond of friendship, and the Prophet ﷺ trusted Al-Abbas. And so, uh, Jabir says, uh, that we came in front of the Prophet wasallam, and Abbas was the one who stood up to speak on behalf of the Prophet And he said, Ya Khazraj. He called them by Khazraj, even though there were some Os people, because the majority were still Khazraj. And in the eyes of Abbas, he, ca- he cannot see Muslim and, and Kafir, he only sees Khazraj and Quraysh and Aus, right? This is the eyes of Jahiliya. When he looks at the people, he can't see them as Muslims. He is viewing them as Khazraj and Aus, and the majority are Khazraj, so he goes, Ya Khazraj, O people of the Khazraj, you know the status of this man amongst us, meaning the Prophet you know his status amongst us, the Banu Hashim, and we have protected him from his own people, even though we agree with our people, i.e., we agree with the same religion as our people, but we have prevented the Quraysh from harming this man. He has izzah and honor amongst us, and he has protection, but he has decided to leave us to go over to you. So, if you are sure that you can live up to your conditions with him, and protect him from those who disagree, then you shall bear his responsibility, otherwise let him be from now. Make sure you can promise him what you're going to live up to. And realize, Abbas concludes, that he is honored amongst his people. Abbas is clearly not trusting of the Khazraj. Abbas is clearly very hesitant at what's happening, and he's also embarrassed at the fact that his own nephew has to leave the Banu Hashim. Clearly. And so he's trying to overcompensate by saying he has izza and he has protection, but that's not true. Amongst the Quraysh, they tried to kill him multiple times. The assassination plot is going to take place three weeks after this conversation. The major assassination, the night before the Ijra, few weeks after this conversation, right? This is not true. But Abbas feels embarrassed that our own, my own nephew has to leave Mecca because we couldn't do our job, basically. So he tries to reclaim that honor by saying, look, we are great people and we've done this and that. Typical, you know, typical tribalistic, nationalistic jingoism here. Just like talking about what good he's done, even though they didn't do much good. Even though the Prophet has to leave his own nation to go and find uh, protection with the people of Yathrib. So uh, the people, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Muslims replied, O oh, Abbas, you have spoken, now let the Prophet speak. I.e., enough, khalas, we don't need you to speak. Okay? Now let the Prophet speak. And Ya Rasulullah, put the conditions that you want. What do you expect from us? Because again, the message that they had sent the Prophet was, come and live with us. This is the message they're sending him. Leave the people of Makkah and come and live with us. And it is really important to note that the offer came from the people of Yathrib. The Prophet didn't impose on them. The people of Yathrib said, come and live with us. So they said, what conditions do you need in order to move to Yathrib? What are the conditions that you need? That What are the conditions you're going to put upon us? The Prophet ﷺ then stood up. And this is taking place in the middle of the night. There are no lights, there are no, it's just the moon there. and there's, uh, It's not even the full moon. It's going to be the 11th of the month, the 12th of the month. Not the full moon there, but there will be uh, uh, this, this bleak, if you like, darkness, along with 
whatever is in the distant light. And the Prophet ﷺ began preaching and advising them to fear Allah Azza wa Jal and reciting them the Quran. And then said, I shall give you the allegiance or the bay'ah. In other words, I'll allow you to give the bay'ah in return for mun'ah, protection. That you shall protect me like one of your own. I.e., what would you do if I was a part of the Khazraj or a part of the, the Aus? You would protect me as one of your own. This is a protection. I.e., I'm going to leave the Banu Hashim. I'm coming over to you. And as long as you agree to make me the same as one of yours, then I will basically agree with this, uh, with the Bay'ah. And so... Al-Bara ibn Ma'rur stood up, one of the Ansar. Al-Bara ibn Ma'rur stood up. And he said, we are people experienced in the arts of war. They've just gone through a civil war. We are people who have experienced the arts of war. We have inherited it from our forefathers. This is an easy condition. We know, we can protect. Nobody's going to harm you, don't worry. Stretch forth your hand and we will give you the allegiance. Hasty, but also Iman. He wants to get it done with. Yes, we're here. Another Ans- Ansari stood up. I'm, being Ans- I'm saying Ansari here, you know what I mean. They're, they're not called Ansari yet, but they will be called Ansari. And this is the famous Abu Haytham ibn Tayhan. Abu Haytham ibn Tayhan, he is the one regarding whom, uh, Abu Haytham is the one whom, who passed by the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar when all three of them had no food to eat. And each one has the stone on his stomach. And Abu Haytham said, I can't bear to see this. And he went back to his wife and said, whatever you have, we're going to cook it and give it. She said, we only have one old goat left, just get rid of it. We're going to zabah and have يعني, uh, a feast for the Prophet So this is the, the famous Abu uh, Abul Haytham, this is that one. And there are other stories about Abu Haytham as well. So Abu Haytham stood up. This is a man of intelligence. Al-Bara is a man of impatience and he wants to get over with. But it's also Iman as well. Abu Haytham stood up, a little bit smarter. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, we have ties with the Yahud. We have political treaties with them. By accepting you, those treaties will be broken and we know it. He's a smart man, he knows exactly what he's talking about. By accepting you, that means those protections are broken. So, once you come over to our side, and then Allah gives us victory, will you then leave us and go back to your people? This is his fear and worry. That if we were to now be with you, eventually Quraysh will be conquered. He has iman. Allah is going to give victory to us, right? He knows. This is the messenger of Allah. These people firmly believe this is Rasulullah. They have no question. They're going to change their whole lifestyle. So he's saying, once we win over the Quraysh, what an amazing man. There's 70 people. The Quraysh are 1,000. But he knows the day will come that they will win over the Quraysh. And what is his fear? When we win over them, are you going to go back to Mecca? Subhanallah. This is what he's worried about. Are you going to go back to Mecca and then you're going to leave us in a very difficult situation in Medina? Because we would have broken all of our political alliances with everybody else. And so the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he said, very profound phrase in Arabic, when you translate it, it, it loses everything. Uh, which basically means, no, my blood is your blood. And my destruction is your destruction. I.e. we are one people. We're gonna, in English we say we're going to live together, we're going to die together. That's what it basically translates as, right? That no, this is a permanent emigration. Once I cut off ties from Mecca, I am going to be a Madani. I'm going to be a part of you. And uh, this was the condition that they wanted. And subhanAllah, isn't it amazing? Look at the people of Yathrib, the Ansar. What were they worried about when Allah will give them victory? That the Prophet will leave them. Contrast this to the people of Kinda. A few months ago, right? When Allah gives us victory, will you make us the rulers? That's what their condition was, remember? Right? And that's why Allah said, you're not worthy of it. No, sorry. You're not. Even though the irony, they would have become the rulers. But when that was their goal, no. You embrace Islam for the sake of God. 
You are righteous because you expect your reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, there's uh, an element here of uh, uh, the the iman of the Aws and Khazraj, the iman of the uh, the people of Yemen. Uh, why do I say people of Yemen, by the way? Because the Aws and the Khazraj, we're going to come to this maybe in two weeks. The Aws and the Khazraj are in fact Yemeni Arabs. The Aws and the Khazraj are Yemeni Arabs. They came from Yemen 300 years before this. And their tribes go back to uh, uh, the, the, the tribes of Qahtan. Remember way back we did Qahtan and Adnan, remember? <laughs> should I quiz you now or I should just ignore? No, no, don't do that, huh? So these are the Qahtani Arabs, right? These are the uh, Qahtani Arabs. And this is one of the major forefathers of the Arabs. And the Aws and the Khazrat are from a totally different branch than the Quraysh. Totally different branch than the Quraysh. And the Aws and the Khazrat are from a branch that is basically Yemeni. And there are so many ahadith about Ahl Yemen, right? The Prophet ﷺ said that the people of Yemen are the softest in their hearts and the gentlest in their chests. I.e. they're very good people. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Imanu Yamanin wal Hikmatu Yamaniya, right? That Iman is Yemeni and wisdom is Yemenite. And it's these things, even in the Aws and Khazraj, we see their wisdom uh, here. Also, subhanAllah, notice, I mean, the Iman of Abu Tayhan and also his bravery. I mean, what a frank and a blunt question. It might even border on the sacrilegious. But there is freedom here. There's no, there's no, there's no uh, uh, fear that am I allowed to ask such a blunt question. Straight to the Prophet ﷺ. What are you going to do once we win? What are you going to do when we do everything you want? Are you going to then abandon us or will you stay with us? Because he wants to be with the Prophet ﷺ. And there's this openness and freedom that is really amazing to see. And also, once the Prophet ﷺ gave his word, obviously he lived up to it. Right? When he did reconquer Mecca, and in front of him is the house of Khadija where he lived for 20 years. And in front of him is the house of Abu Talib where he grew up for 40 years. And he is with his tribe and his family and his entire, and his entire extended family is there. And they have now all accepted Islam. And he could have moved back to his hometown. What did he do? Eventually he turned his back to Mecca and he walked back to Medina. And he lived in Medina and he died in Medina and he is buried in Medina. He lived up to his word. Once I leave, I will be with you. And the Prophet ﷺ praised the Ansar in so many ahadith. We'll talk about them inshaAllah uh, in a while. So they said, O Messenger of Allah, what should we give you bay'atan? Khalas, we agree. What, are, what, what is the phrase of the bay'ah we should give? So the Prophet ﷺ said, you must give the bay'ah, you must give the oath of allegiance that you hear and you obey in ease and in, and in difficult, i.e. In, what, in times of difficulty, in times of ease, and that you spend of your money in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that you command the good and forbid the, uh, the evil, and that you speak the truth no matter what the consequences. Never lie no matter what the consequences, and that you help me once I come to Yathrib, and this is one of the only times he called it Yathrib. One of the only times he called it Yathrib, because he was going to change the name very soon. And that you help me when I come to Yathrib, just like you help your own family and your own uh, uh, wives and children. I.e., I become your family. I become a part of you. So these are now political conditions. It's not just be a good Muslim and pray and, and worship. It's also that you will protect me. If the Quraysh come and attack, we will attack and fight back. This is not the bay'ah of women. This is another bay'ah. This is a political bay'ah. And so this is the second bay'ah, and these oaths were much more stringent. Once the Prophet ﷺ said this, a voice cried out in the, from amongst them, and what shall we get in return? What is in it for us? And the Prophet ﷺ said the one word that they wanted to hear. Al-Jannah. I can't give you any money. I can't promise you fame and fortune. Paradise will be yours. You help the Messenger of Allah, and Allah will give you His pleasure. That's all I can promise you. And that's all they wanted to hear. And so, they all stood up to give bay'ah to him. And before anybody could embrace the Prophet's hand, As'ad ibn Zurara held on to the Prophet's hand and kept it down. This is a freedom of expression that is unbelievable. He did not allow him to raise his hand. And he said, wait everybody. Remember, As'ad is 
the one housing Mus'ab. As'ad is one of the first converts. As'ad is one of the six who spoke was two years ago. So, As'ad is one of the leaders of the Muslims. As'ad held on to the Prophet and said, and said, Ruwaydan, wait, calm down. O people of Yathrib, we haven't traveled all of this distance and undertaken this long journey except that we know that this man is the messenger of Allah. We know this. And once his people expel him, i.e. he leaves it over to us, then you will be asking for war. This is a very big decision. Once his people expel him, they will try to kill him now. You will be asking for war. And so if you're ready that your necks meet swords, i.e. you're ready to die, then go and give him the oath of allegiance. And realize that the best of you will be killed. The best of you will be killed. And fathers will lose their sons, and sons will lose their fathers. And you will cause death amongst yourselves by accepting him. Realize this. If you're prepared to do this, then give him the oath. If not, then stop now. Perchance Allah will forgive you because you didn't give the oath. I.e., are you ready? You're really sure you're up to the standards. This isn't a joke. This is the last chance. Once you put your hand in his hand, end of story. And this is the intelligence of Asad. That he did not want the punishment of Allah to come if his tribe eventually said, I can't do that, sorry, too much. Telling them one last chance. And they said, O oh, Asad, you have spoken enough. Get your hand off the hand of the Prophet We want to put it. They're eager. We want to embrace his hand and give him the bay'ah. And so, one by one, all 72 men amongst them gave the bay'ah of the Prophet wasallam, and in return promised them Jannah, one by one. What a beautiful, blessed group that is. And the two women that were present there, and there were two women there, the Prophet ﷺ took their oath of allegiance verbally, he did not take it uh, in his hand. As we know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ never touched the hand of a woman that was not related to him. And this is well known, and this is another instance here. The Prophet ﷺ did not take the oath uh, from their hand, and he simply took it shafahatan or, uh, or uh, verbally. And when the entire oath was finished, Abbas was looking along in great worry and great anger and great irritation and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, these are people I don't know any of them and all of them are young kids I don't know who they are I don't know what you're doing he's very worried about the Prophet ﷺ, but if Abbas did not know them then Allah Azza wa Jal knew them if Abbas did not recognize them then Allah and his messenger did indeed recognize them and uh, they all finished up the Bay'atul Aqaba and uh, inshallah ta'ala we will continue uh, we need to uh, stop here for uh, a few announcements in Q&A uh, we inshallah continue talking about the very last incidents in this Bay'ah and then also uh, the actual Hijrah which will be done inshallah ta'ala uh, next Wednesday we'll talk about the Hijrah and some of the benefits that we get from this incident of the uh, of the second Bay'atul Aqaba with that if there are any questions inshallah ta'ala we can take a few questions now yes go ahead so, I Yes, we already said that uh, the Prophet had relationships with Yathrib. Clearly, Allah Azza wa Jal had uh, planned this that the Prophet's great grandmother. Uh, was from Yathrib, and so he had some distant cousins from Yathrib, and even Amina went to visit Yathrib and uh, dine on the way back. So this is all in the plan of Allah. And the question is, like, uh, we talk about Ashra and Mubashra, but it seems there are more, many more people who were given... Yes, there were many more people. What is the separate significance of Ashra and Mubashra as compared to these 70? You just told us that these 70 were also guaranteed by 72, and then the one who came earlier also guaranteed by Multiple people, it's not just the 10. Multiple people. But these 10 were of the earliest who were promised paradise. And these 10 were promised paradise in a hadith that actually lists all 10 of them by name. 
So the Prophet ﷺ said, Abu Bakr fil Jannah, wa Umar fil Jannah, wa Uthman fil Jannah, wa Ali fil Jannah, and he went on and he listed all ten. So they have a special significance over the others. The rankings of the Sahaba, uh, we mentioned before, there's multiple rankings of the Sahaba, and uh, the Muhajirun have a ranking and the Ansar have a ranking. The highest amongst the Ansar are those who attended the first bay'ah and then those who attended the second bay'ah. So they have a ranking that is of the highest of the Ansar.